So come back to my painting of Captain Cole. I'm like, okay, this is just, and look at all the material in these canoes. There's screws, there's berries, there's elk, there's baskets of food, there's goods and boxes, um, bales and stuff. These are just jam packed full of things that have been brought in. So not only do we have a lot of canoes jammed in here, but the canoes are full. Things are coming in, things are going in. These are Chinookan canoes. Uh, this is out of Lewis and Clark. You see the fig figure that they show, spear like figure, and the human figure on uh, the canoe. This is uh, the end of a burial canoe. This is another burial canoe, but the, using regular canoes. This is uh, Swan's drawing of a small chicken house in local bay, and these are small uh, canoes. This is a Curtis photograph of another Chinook and South canoe taken about 1910. This is at the Dells. This is actually a shovel nose, big shovel nose canoe. And then this is at Baker Bay. We talked about this this morning, the series of canoes where they're plugging, fishing for salmon at the dawn. There's the sun coming out. And then these are northern canoes. And then these photographs of canoes from Puget Sound. There are no photographs I'm aware of canoes down here. So this gives you a sense, again, like the Catholic Bowl of Painting, this is not a village, but a camp, of the number of canoes that one might expect to see. Hundreds of them. This one shows a family or a small group, uh, standard size canoe, just crammed full of stuff. So this, again, is the hauling capacity. This one I like, because uh, it shows people working in canoes from early childhood. This is not a very old boy, very small kid. And I've got accounts. Canadian magistrate talking about children on most of the Vancouver Island taking canoes, small kids, four or five, taking canoes up rough streams. Uh, sort of, they learn to walk and then they learn to manage a canoe, or they learn to manage a canoe and then they learn to walk. Um, and so that's why that's in there. Everybody's like, oh, we're kidding a boat. Uh, and then this one is just packed full again. I like it because it's full. And then this is the only one I can find that gives you a sense of the size, potential size of these vessels. That's a big, that's a big boat. Um, and we'll talk about the size here in a minute. So there are three basic size categories. There's small canoes, like these, uh, 12, 12 to 18 feet. And I like to think of them as the Volkswagen of the coast. Um, there are medium-sized canoes, which run from 18 to about 35 feet. And she's sitting in one here. So this is, this is the workhorse of the Columbia, Lower Columbia, the workhorse of the coast from here to southeast Alaska. This is that canoe. And I like to think of it as either a uh, minivan or a pickup truck. And I actually picked this one deliberately with a crew cab because of the capacity to carry people. One of the things, well, and then there's really great, what I call great canoes, which run from 40 to 60 feet, like that big canoe that I just showed you. Um, some places there are two kinds, there's a freight canoe and a war canoe. The freight canoe has a really broad beam, and they're tall, but they, they're really broad, whereas the, the war canoe is much narrower, but also still much taller inside. The one that I showed you, the big one that I showed you, is probably a war canoe. Some places there's no distinction, they're just big canoes. Um, and these run from 40 to 60 feet, and I like to think of them as a destroyer, a war canoe, but also the equivalent of the local equivalent of a Kenworth, they've got 12,000 pounds of stuff in them. Maybe more like a two-ton truck, but Kenworth is makes the point. And then also, like the Winnebago, I think I told you, you know, the Kobach are moving. They're moving everybody and everything. So canoes also have that function. And I don't think most people think of it that way. Ooh. And then this is a painting of people moving, uh, coming into Nootka. Uh, I told us. I've given give this canoe, this canoe, I've given this talk back to back, therefore my wires came across. <laughs> and I don't remember what I, but I told them, and it's boring to hear, oh, I said this to the previous group, I have to tell you. Um, but with this, um, John Jessup was an American of the ship Tonkin. And the Tonkin went into Nootka Harbor, I think it was 1802, and Nootka, not in the, yeah, the Nootka went out, the Neutralmouth went out, and took the ship, and killed everybody on board except for Jessup, the guy with him. And Jessup was saved because he was a, he was a blacksmith, and the chief, McQuinnah, wanted a blacksmith, and Jessup told 
Oh, uh, not Joseph. Um, Jewett. Jewett told me Quinn that the other man was his brother. <laughs> so um, Quinn let, let him live. And in his account, Jewett talks about, he's been captured sometime in late summer, that around about December, Quinn decides to move up the fjord, some distance, like 40 miles. And so, you know, there's big houses, the frames, the planks are, are tied to the frames. They take the planking down, they put them across the canoes, and they stack everything on the canoes, and move the whole kit and caboodle up the fjord, and set it back up again in a period of a day or two. So the village goes, Puff! It's intact, it's there, and it's operating again. They were there for two or three weeks, they got what they needed, they took it down, and they moved it again. So you have an entire village of several hundred people in a moving, getting, you know, lock, stock, and barrel, literally. Let me just stop, but they have barrels. Uh, very, very swiftly across the landscape of the seascape. And so that's the capacity that these boats gave people to take advantage of resources or take advantage of other circumstances very, very swiftly. It's hard to do that on foot. So this again are people moving into uh, the harbor through the, through the surf. Uh, how much time do I have, Kitty? Okay, great. That time for the story. Nutka comes from a misunderstanding of the name Nutka. When Cook's vessels went into the harbor, the English leaned over the boat, their, their ship, and they yelled down to the canoes full of warriors and other people, you know, what are you called? And the people on the boat yelled back, Nutka, Nutka, Nutka. Nutka means move your boat. Isn't <laughs> that wonderful? I love that story. I tell that, I'm sure there are a couple people probably heard of God who's telling a new Nootka Movie Road story again. Uh, so the folks in Nootka Harbor, so called Nootka Harbor, would like to be called the children. Um, they don't want to be called Movie Road. But um, <laughs> that time. Because they were right in the way. They had an anchorage. They wanted to move into the anchorage. They weren't in the anchorage. The boats are made, the vessels, and I call them boats. Uh, I call them boats, they're canoes, technically canoes, I call them boats. Because when we think canoes, especially in English speaking, canoes conveys a different sense, at least to me. We call it a boat. I mean, if you have a thing that's 60 feet long and it carries 12,000 pounds worth of stuff, somehow a canoe doesn't cover it. Boat works better. They're boats. Uh, they're not ships because they don't have three masts. But anyway, these are the tools. And you can go out and see these in the hands of carvers. There's an adze with a stone, uh, stone blade. Here are examples. There's an exhaustive one. I've turned it over. It's worn down to a nose. It's about the size of my thumb. Uh, here's a large one that's been worn down somewhat, but it's still useful. It's got wear up here. I don't know what they're doing. This is an iron one from Captain Hubble that dates to AD 1450 with the same wear. Uh, I'm going to know that Mike Cohell with the axe and boy had brought back the blade with that kind of a mick out of it. I would have had a, this is interesting conversation with my father. Um, and somebody brought me to that. I had this never known yet, right? This was somebody had a lot, had a lot of trouble with that. Um, elk antler splitting wedge, and that's it. So those things I showed you photographs of were made basically with this equipment. And then with these hammers that were used, these stone hammers that were used to drive the wedges and also to drive stones, uh, drive the walls. They're also a half ball. I don't have a picture of a wall and a half. You can swing like a small two pound or four pound hammer. That's it. That's how they're made. So this painting, this photograph shows these guys working out four canoes from one uh, cedar tree. This tree is sawn. And the point of this picture, besides the fact that they're working on the canoes, though he's got a little, you know, a little steel saw out here. He's cheating. Um, is that it's cut down. Traditionally, uh, felling would have been, a, traditionally, trees would be felled by building a fire at their base and burning through and killing the tree, or girdling the tree, cutting through the bark, through the tissue under the bark, through which the tree feeds itself and breathes into the heartwood, and then the tree would suffocate and then fall and it could bring it down after it died. But you couldn't cut, you can't cut one of those things down with one of these. Even a really big one. I couldn't get a picture of a big one. There's some big heavy ones that weigh several pounds. Uh, for a large cedar, you can't do it. And so I think 
big storms, like the infamous Columbus Day storm here, and other things that would bring trees down, big floods that would bring trees in, would be very, very important. 